In the spring of 1769, Letizia and Carlo Bonaparte were crossing the mountains that straddled the interior of the island of Corsica. They were Corsican patriots, determined to repel a French army that had invaded their tiny island nation. The Corsicans were only about 100 to 120,000 people of peasant or shepherd origin. They had very few firearms, very little gunpowder, and that was all. They had to defend themselves against the 22 million population of France, then the most advanced country in Europe. The Corsicans never stood a chance. After a year of fighting, leaving thousands dead and wounded, they were defeated, and Letizia and Carlo were going home. Letizia was six months pregnant. That summer, Letizia was celebrating the Feast of the Assumption when she felt her first labor pain. Later that day, August 15, 1769, she gave birth to a son, Napoleone, Napoleone Bonaparte. Born just after the bitter French conquest, Napoleon would spend his childhood hating France, the nation he would one day rule. I was born when Corsica was perishing, Napoleon later wrote. 30,000 Frenchmen spewed onto our shores, drowning the throne of liberty in waves of blood. The cries of the dying, the groans of the oppressed, and tears of despair surrounded my cradle from the hour of my birth. Corsica was now a French colony suspended in the mediterranean between france and italy for centuries corsicans had fiercely resisted invaders romans moors genoese after the french victory corsican rebels fled to the mountains where they continued to fight on but napoleon's father carlo a 23 year old university student readily submitted soon he was wearing powdered wigs embroidered waistcoats and silver-buckled shoes. Napoleon never forgave him for betraying his Corsican heritage. He would later say harshly that his father was rather too fond of pleasure. I think Napoleon always held a grudge against his father for having submitted. But poor Carlo, he knew he had lost the battle. He realized the French were there, so he had to live with them and make the best of it. Carlo began practicing law, won election to the Corsican Assembly, and rose in the esteem of the French rulers. But Napoleon rarely had a good thing to say about him. He saved his praise for his mother. The beautiful, strong-willed Letizia. As a mother, he would say, she was without equal. He was obsessed by her, fascinated by her, praised her enormously. She was a very tough and determined little woman. Thirteen times pregnant, she had eight surviving children. He says that all his success in life was due to the training she gave him. La mère. The mother. What a man, Napoleon said. She has the head of a man on the body of a woman. Carlo and Letizia owned a house in the country as well as one in the city, a mark of their status. They were Corsican aristocrats, but they were not rich. With eight children, they struggled just to get by on an island that had been impoverished for centuries. There was nothing the ambitious couple believed that Corsica could offer them or their children. Only one country could, the country that had vanquished their own, 
France. As a representative of the Corsican parliament, Carlo traveled to Versailles. There he saw the splendor of the French court in all its majesty. France was the envy of Europe. Great Britain, Austria, Prussia, Spain, none had more people or greater wealth. While America was just beginning its experiment with democracy, Versailles gave testimony to the power of kings. Carlo was an awestruck provincial. Rumblings of discontent with King Louis XVI and aristocratic privilege were no concern of his. That Queen Marie Antoinette and a frivolous court were draining France of precious resources did nothing to diminish Carlo's delight in everything he saw. He dreamed that one day his children would become noblemen in that glittering citadel of power in which he had no place. For years, Carlo had nourished a plan. In Versailles, he saw it come true. He secured Napoleon a scholarship to a school in France. Napoleon set foot in France for the first time in the winter of 1778 a thin, sallow nine-year-old, accustomed to the warmth of the Mediterranean, suddenly alone on the windswept plains of northern France. A scholarship boy at the Royal Military College at Brienne-le-Chateau. He could hardly speak French. For the next five years, there would be no holidays, no visits home. He had no love of France. He still thought of himself as a grudging subject of an alien king. He thinks of himself as a Corsican. He is surrounded by students who are the children of French aristocrats. And they have nothing in common with this little foreigner. And since he is quite proud, he becomes a loner. Napoleon would one day turn his sympathies toward France, but not without years of resentment and struggle. He was 15 when he was promoted to the Royal Military Academy in Paris. Along with the sons of some of France's greatest families, he would learn the splendors of French civilization. The Royal Academy was as much a finishing school, turning officers into gentlemen as a war college. We were magnificently fed and served, Bonaparte said, treated in every way like officers possessed of great wealth. The poor Corsican teenager still felt like an outsider. He had entered a world of opulence and luxury, but it only served to fuel his scorn for the privilege and snobbery of the French nobility. One teacher described him as quiet and solitary, frightfully egotistical, proud, ambitious, aspiring to everything. He would go far, his school report read, in favorable circumstances. He began his apprenticeship as a soldier when he was 16, a lowly second lieutenant, training with the best artillery unit in the French army. He grew expert at sighting a gun, handling rammer and shot, deploying men. One of the greatest careers in military history had begun. He feels that the regime will not let him have the position he dreams of. The top positions are reserved for the noblemen. While Napoleon comes from minor nobility, poor people. Frustrated in his military ambitions, Bonaparte dreamed of becoming famous as an author. 
wrote a brief history of Corsica, even tried his hand at a novel. He knows that he's capable of great things. He feels that perhaps he's destined for greatness. But at that point, how can he possibly believe it? He's bored to death. Always alone among men, Bonaparte wrote, I come home to dream by myself and to give myself over to all the forces of my melancholy. My thoughts dwell on death. What fury drives me to wish for my own destruction? No doubt because I see no place for myself in this world. It was the revolution that would set Bonaparte free. On July 14, 1789, Paris erupted. Angry crowds stormed through the streets, crying liberty, equality, brotherhood. France was thrown into turmoil. The monarchy itself tottered on the edge of destruction. A defiant National Assembly challenged the absolute right of the king, stripped nobles and clergy of their ancient feudal privileges, fracturing a social order that had endured for centuries. After years of injustice and inequality, the revolution had begun. It would take years before it would end. As the revolution gained momentum, Bonaparte was serving in the army far from Paris. He distrusted the violent mobs, but welcomed the changes transforming the country. He is certainly not a revolutionary before the beginning of the revolution. But Bonaparte welcomes the revolution as good news. It almost has a religious impact for him. Because all of a sudden he feels that the revolution is going to open up French society. La révolution va ouvrir la société française. L'abolition des privileges, le fait que la société française ne va plus It would abolish privileges, put an end to hierarchies and the kind of condescension from which Napoleon had suffered while he was growing up. Napoleon dans sa jeunesse. Bonaparte was a man of his time, and to be 20 years old in 1789 is very important. Napoleon's destiny and the destiny of the whole country become the same. In the summer of 1792, Bonaparte was on leave in Paris witnessed the last gasp of the French monarchy. In June, a mob stormed the Tuileries Palace and forced the king to wear the red revolutionary bonnet. In August, the mob massacred the king's Swiss guard. King Louis XVI was dethroned. The French Republic was proclaimed that fall. Napoleon wants to be part of this new world. He wants to play a role. And he starts in a place he knows very well. He starts with Corsica. Bonaparte was 23, an idealistic revolutionary, when he took leave of absence from the French army and returned to Corsica. The French Republic had made Corsica a part of France, and given Corsicans all the rights and liberties of French citizens. Bonaparte, a lieutenant in the island's National Guard, threw himself into Corsican politics. Pasquale Paoli was the island's governor. 
Pauli had been Bonaparte's childhood hero, the leader of the Corsican War against France. Now Bonaparte dreamed of rising to power, standing by Pauli's side. But he would be bitterly disappointed. Pauli did not trust him. A ragazzoni inesperto, Pauli called him. A big, inexperienced boy. The Corsican patriot thought Bonaparte too ambitious, too self-centered, too sympathetic to France. Bonaparte and Paoli are on totally different wavelengths. Paoli retains the idea that Corsica should be independent. By this time, Napoleon Bonaparte uh, is, is, is perfectly uh, comfortable with a, a Corsica that is part of revolutionary France. Bonaparte soon became the leader of a faction opposed to Paoli. Clan rivalry ran deep on the island, intensifying the political struggle between the two men. Pauli's partisans and Bonaparte's were soon at war. In the end, Pauli proved too strong. Bonaparte's home was sacked and he was forced to flee to the mountains. The Corsican assembly declared Bonaparte and his entire family traitors and enemies of the fatherland, condemned to perpetual execration and infamy. Bonaparte no longer had the right to live in Corsica. He had been given a death sentence by his own people. His idealism shaken, Bonaparte wrote his brother, among so many conflicting ideas, the honest man is confused and distressed. Since one must take sides, one might as well choose the side which is victorious. Considering the alternative, it is better to eat than be eaten. The defeat in Corsica, the break with his hero Pauli, had toughened him, made him shrewd, and turned him toward France. From the time when there is this breakup with Paoli's Corsica, he is French. He wants to be French. He is French. On June 10th, 1793, he set sail for France with his widowed mother, three brothers, and three sisters. A refugee family, carrying with them all they owned in the world. 24 years old, he was banished from the land of his birth forever. Bonaparte returned to France to find the French fighting among themselves. The king had been executed. The queen and thousands more followed him to the guillotine. There were cities in revolt, uprisings in the provinces. Maximilien Robespierre was in charge now. The austere, moralizing leader suspended the Constitution, vowing to save the Republic from its enemies at any cost. The revolution turned into the terror. Torn by civil war, France was also at war with almost all of Europe. Austria, Spain, Prussia, and Great Britain were bent on destroying the new French Republic, while French radicals promised to help all peoples rise against their rulers. Reinstated in the army as an artillery captain, Bonaparte was ordered to Toulon, a city of 28,000 on the southern coast that had rebelled against the Republic, throwing its port open to the English. The British fleet defended the city from the harbor, 24-year-old Bonaparte thought he knew how to drive them out. He argued that if his soldiers could seize the heights commanding the harbor, they could bombard the fleet, drive it away, and the city would fall. It was a simple plan, but none of the generals would listen. The generals in Toulon were total incompetence, or a little worse. Finally, a fairly competent general showed up, 
listened to Napoleon's plans and said, naturally. This would be Bonaparte's first great chance. With the aristocratic officers fleeing the country, there was suddenly a vacuum, an opportunity for rapid promotion for soldiers who could prove themselves under fire. Bonaparte fought bravely, leading his men in the assault on the fort guarding the heights, suffering a wound in the thigh from an enemy bayonet. Ten ships went up in flames. The British fled. Toulon was recaptured and Bonaparte promoted. In just three months, he had risen from captain to brigadier general. The Republic continued to fight for its life, still clashing with enemies beyond its borders, still in turmoil at home. With France in chaos, threatened on all sides, Robespierre showed no mercy in his efforts to bring about unity and order. Liberty, he said, cannot be secured unless criminals lose their heads. Determined to make his voice heard, Bonaparte wrote a political tract in support of Robespierre. The young soldier hated the terror, but he hated chaos even more. Bonaparte is really a man of order. For him, order has to serve ideals, exactly the idea of Robespierre. It is necessary to suspend liberties in the name of liberty. In order to save liberty, to save the Republic, it's necessary to suspend individual liberties. In the summer of 1794, Robespierre's government fell. Now it was the turn of those who made the terror to die, including Robespierre. In the spring of 1795, Bonaparte headed for Paris. Now a brigadier general, he was determined to rise still higher. France had a new constitutional government. The guillotine, the riots in the street, the war still raging along the frontier, all seemed forgotten. Bonaparte frequented the salons where the women who dominated Paris society held court. The women here, he wrote his brother, are the center of importance. Here, alone of all places on earth, they appear to hold the reins of government. But they wanted little to do with him. He was just another ambitious young soldier. I can still picture him, one noble woman remembered. He wore badly made dirty boots and a nasty round hat pulled down over his eyes. An overall sickly effect was created by this thinness and his yellow complexion. Bonaparte seemed to have come to a dead end. He was desperate for promotion, but no one paid any attention. If this continues, he wrote his brother, I shall end by not stepping aside when a carriage rushes past. Then political turmoil once again gave him his chance. On October 5th, 1795, crowds of Parisians stormed through the streets alongside National Guardsmen bent on restoring the monarchy. The rebellion threatened to topple the Republic. The government called on Bonaparte to repel the attack. There wasn't much other choice, actually, when this rebellion broke. There aren't any competent generals in Paris. Here's young Bonaparte. He's a man of uh, 
conviction, uh, put him in. Napoleon was not one to pussyfoot around. He would use all his weapons. Nobody had really used cannon on the Paris mobs before. He was going to shoot. He waited till they could see the whites of their eyes. The enemy attacked us, Bonaparte wrote his brother. We killed a great many of them. Now all is quiet. I could not be happier. Three weeks later, he was made a full general, commander of the Army of the Interior. He was 26. Bonaparte was now a man to be reckoned with. He was driving through Paris in a fine carriage, wearing new clothes, drenching himself in eau de cologne. The unsophisticated general was no ladies' man, but he had fallen in love. Her name was Marie Joseph Rose de Beauharnais. Everyone called her Rose. Bonaparte called her Josephine. She was a Creole aristocrat from the French colony of Martinique, a 32-year-old widow with two small children, deep in debt, trying to make her way in Paris alone. Languid, with a nonchalant shading into indolence, she was known as a woman of refinement, charm, and grace. It was said that she even went to bed gracefully. Bonaparte was dazzled by her, I was naturally timid among women, he said. Madame de Beauharnais was the first woman who gave me any degree of confidence. Josephine was what might be called a slightly fast woman. She'd been married young, her husband had died in the guillotine. She'd had an affair with somebody that helped her out. And it was well known she had affairs with men in high French society. No one stood higher than Paul Barat, the most powerful figure in the new government. Josephine was his mistress, a woman of influence in the most fashionable salons in Paris. Bonaparte saw her in a world of power. She was at the center of society. She had all these connections. She was very much someone who could be useful to him. And then I think he just fell madly in love with her. Josephine lived in a little cottage set in a pleasant garden. Some said it was Barat who paid the rent. But Barat was growing tired of her. Now Bonaparte visited her there. Josephine seemed amused by her new lover. Although she knew how to please him, she did not return his passion. When Bonaparte proposed marriage, she hesitated. She wasn't attracted to him at all. In fact, she told a friend later that she, for a long time she had to overcome a feeling of repugnance. He was so serious and he had no sense of humor. He was skinny. His hair was kind of hanging and he was unkempt. But she knows her beauty is vanishing. Already her teeth are bad, she's getting wrinkles. Napoleon doesn't see it, but others see it, and she sees it. Her looks fading and her debts mounting, she needed a protector. On March 9, 1796, Napoleon Bonaparte and Josephine de Beauharnais were married. A gold enameled medallion was the general's wedding gift to his bride. On it were inscribed the words, to destiny. Bonaparte was sent to the Italian Alps. 
Josephine's former lover, Paul Barat, had helped win him an appointment as supreme commander of all French forces in Italy. His assignment was to challenge the Empire of Austria and their Italian allies. He had never commanded an army before. Young and untested, no one expected very much from him, especially his own generals. Tout le monde l'attend avec un peu de moquerie. Everyone makes fun of him before he gets there. This little general who perhaps owes his command to his wife. Then he arrives. And within a few moments, the veterans who made fun of him understand exactly. He is in charge. I don't know why, one of his generals said, but the little bastard scares me. Bonaparte's army was in no condition to win battles. It had been stagnating under incompetent commanders in the foothills of the Alps for almost two years. Soldiers, he proclaimed, you are naked and ill-fed. No fame shines upon you. I will lead you into the most fertile plains in the world. Rich provinces, great cities will lie in your power. You will find there honor, glory, and riches. He really enthralls them. He's a terrific actor. He is capable of laughing, smiling. And then suddenly he is passionate, inspiring fear, horror, and anger. On April 2, 1796, Bonaparte led his army forward. He was badly outnumbered. 38,000 French soldiers faced 38,000 Austrians and their allies, 25,000 Piedmontese. Bonaparte planned to isolate the Austrians from the Piedmontese, then conquer each separately. He would strike first at Piedmont. In just two weeks, he won six battles, took thousands of prisoners, and broke the back of Piedmont's army. One Piedmontese officer would later complain, they sent a young madman who attacks right, left, and from the rear. It's an intolerable way of making war. On April 26th, Piedmont surrendered. Bonaparte demanded gold and silver and paid his troops, the first real money they had seen in years. Soldiers, he said, we thank you. While Bonaparte led his soldiers into battle, he never stopped thinking of Josephine, writing her letter after letter, day after day. Not a day goes by without my loving you, he wrote her. Not a night without holding you in my arms. I curse the glory and ambition which keeps me from the soul of my life. Whenever I am troubled as to how things will turn out, I put my hand to my heart where throbs your likeness. I have but to look at it, and my love is perfect happiness. Josephine would sometimes read his letters aloud to friends. Bonaparte, she told them, is so amusing. With Piedmont defeated, Bonaparte was now pursuing the Austrians, who retreated to the east, bewildered, by the 26-year-old general and his new way of making war. In the 18th century, there were nobles commanding on both sides and they had a, a certain code. The armies would maneuver and very often if one had the other in check, that would be the end of it. There would be no fight. Napoleon was in a way the first modern general. He did not accommodate those old codgers on the other side uh, at all. He attacks every day. He attacks when it snows, he attacks at night, he attacks when it's cold. It's not the way the game is played. He looks for the enemy, fights it, and when they assume that he's going to stop, he continues. The next day he fights again. It surprises them.
As the Austrians fled, their rear guard hoped to slow Bonaparte down by making a stand at the little Italian town of Lodi. They fortified a narrow wooden bridge with 14 cannon and three battalions and dared Bonaparte to cross it. The general ordered a simple frontal assault on the bridge. Everything would depend on the courage of his men. He had earned their admiration with his rapid string of victories. Now he would find out if he also had their faith. How do you incite men to do something like that? It's charisma. I mean, it got tremendous presence. Napoleon was a master at motivating his soldiers. Victory always goes a long way. The more they win, the harder they get to stop. His troops were pretty well hepped up. They'd been chasing Austrians now for weeks, and uh, they went forward. There are no tactics at all. The troops come in so enthusiastically and quickly, it surprises the enemy. It's just a question of enthusiasm. Everyone throws themselves into it. Everyone risks death. With his men facing withering enemy fire, Bonaparte was in the thick of it. He was actually up there laying in the cannon, which was a corporal's job. But he was always up there with them. This is a man with absolute courage. He's wherever he's needed. If he's needed up at the very front to encourage people, he's there. He takes physical risks. Even if cannonballs fall close to him, and this happened on several occasions, he's not afraid. The French made it halfway across the bridge and fell back under a vicious hail of fire. Then, one last charge and they were across. The Austrian guns fell silent. Here they thought they were safe behind the river, holding the bridge. You know, once the French come across the bridge and beat the living Jesus out of them. It's a real spectacular job. It wasn't a big battle, the casualties were not particularly heavy, but he had imposed his will on his own men and the enemy, both. It was not a great victory. The Austrian army had in fact escaped. But Bonaparte had won the respect and devotion of his men. He came out all sweaty and grimy and covered with gun smoke. The troops liked that. They began calling him the little corporal right there. It was, you identify with us, you're, you're, you're our corporal. This is the moment when he becomes convinced that he has a lucky star and that destiny has chosen him to accomplish great things. They haven't seen anything yet, Bonaparte told one of his generals. In our time, no one has the slightest conception of what is great. It is up to me to give them an example. There was a spark. The battle at Lodi convinced Napoleon Bonaparte that he was a man of destiny. From that moment, he said, I foresaw what I might be. 
Already I felt the earth flee from beneath me, as if I were being carried into the sky.